Test, test. Thank you, Mary, for the music very much. Good evening, everyone. What number are we on? I don't know which night we are. Anyway, seven? Eight. Okay, we just passed the perfect number. All right. Well, if you know me, you know I love the seven habits, and keeping the end in mind is almost one. It's uh, begin with the end in mind. It's one of the seven habits, so good, good plan. Um, welcome. Glad you're here. There's lots more here. They're still coming. They're uh, finishing their dinner. Good dinner. Everybody enjoy? Amen. Okay. Please go out your heads with me as we pray and begin. Father, thank you for bringing each one here and those who are listening elsewhere and watching. I pray for your blessing on Gordon and on each one who's listening and participating. I pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds to receive your Holy Spirit and your truth and your word, and it will become life to us and life in us and not just, not just words. I pray that it will change our lives. Thank you, Father, for all you've done for us and how much you've given us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we have uh, Cipriano with a nightly health nugget. Good evening. Oh, you just had dinner. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. I do this to the kids all the time in the morning. I'm like, ah, oh, you ate. I know you ate. Okay. So we've covered numerous topics so far, nutrition and exercise and water. And um, tonight, we're, and trust, we've, that was a, uh, one of the first topics we covered. Tonight, we're t uh, talking about investing time in others. What does that have to do with our own personal health? Well, as we're going to discover, it has a lot to do with our own personal health. All right. Um, I think all of you know this Bible verse. In Acts 20, verse 35, it is better to give than to receive. But is it really better to give than to receive? I know we've heard that, and I know it's, it's a principle that we try to live by, but does it actually affect us physically or mentally uh, more than just spiritually? We are told that we experience the benefits of helping others all the way down to the circulation of our blood. I might need glasses. I can't read that up there. The pleasure of doing good to others imparts a glow to the feelings which flashes through the nerves, quickens the circulation of the blood, and induces mental and physical health. And this was a quote that was written quite a long time ago, um, and we'll see how that is, again, catching up. Science is catching up to God, how that is true um, in this video. And finally, looking to live a little longer, laugh a little more. Well, tonight, we're going to let you in on a little secret. The fountain of youth, that ticket to happiness, might be as simple as being kind to others. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. Check out what happens to your brain when you give to charity. Studies show that people who give or volunteer are less depressed, have lower blood pressure, and live longer. For a majority of people, they actually get more pleasure in these pleasure centers of the brain when they give than when they get. Those are the same pleasure centers that uh, are lit up when you uh, have sex, when you ha uh, have, you know, uh, fall in love, and when you eat candy. Even girls who aren't. New York Times candy. columnist Nick Kristoff and his wife, the writer Cheryl Wu Dunn, have written a new book called A Path of Peers in which they issue a challenge to all of us. If we want to have a truly fulfilled life, we must give back. Well, a lot of people feel there's not much I can do, especially when I look at the intractable nature of the problems out there. Any one individual can't solve a problem in its entirety, but one individual can have a transformative impact. For 50 cents, you can deworm a child, preventing a lifetime of health problems. For $50, you can buy 20 books for a child, dramatically boosting their odds of educational attainment. You're just saying, just do a little bit more. Absolutely. We really do think that if you fold it into your life, it really becomes a part of your life. Make giving a habit, they say, because we now know that it not only helps others, but it also helps 
you. Sometimes I'm Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Make giving a habit good advice for all. All right, make giving a habit. And some people might say, well, I don't have the money, I don't have the time. But you can give um, different ways. You can give money or you can donate, like he was mentioning earlier. You can give of your time. I remember before entering PA school, I was um, required to have a certain amount of hours of volunteer work in hospitals. And so it actually really taught me a lot volunteering. Um, so make time to give. It improves mental and physical health and increases longevity. And we're going to find out how it increases longevity. Uh, it does lower cardiovascular disease risk factors. One of the ways is decreasing hypertension, which is high blood pressure, which is definitely a risk factor for cardiovascular issues as well as type 2 diabetes. Um, when we are kind to others, endorphins via serotonin neurotransmitters are released, which produce a direct high or feel-good response within the nervous system and decreases stress. Um, one of the things that I've actually started doing with my kids, sometimes we get preoccupied with our own problems, and you want to pray about something, and you want the Lord to answer you, and you feel like you've become a broken record. We need this. We need this. Whether it's health, money, job, whatever it could be. Um, one of the things that we've been praying for, I've, you know, and it's been actually three years since we've been praying for this, and the kids keep saying, we have not seen anything happen yet. I said, how about we give it to the Lord, and we trust him, and we start praying for others. So as soon as we started praying for others, not only have they started feeling better about that situation, but they're actually excited because they see how God's helping others, and now they fully trust God even more. So it does help emotionally. It does help mentally, and it does help physically. It actually decreases stress when you give. Um, caring for uh, others activates circuits in the brain that are not active during negative emotions like hate or hostility. According to research, those who assist others, this is what I found really interesting, and I looked this up, and there are actually lots of studies on this even particular topic. If you serve because you want to feel good yourself, again, you're doing it for yourself, you're not going to get the benefits out of this service that you're doing. You technically, yeah, it's amazing. So what it's actually saying is, if you're thinking of the other person and you're really doing this because you're trying to help someone, you're trying to help distribute food or you're trying to help pay for something or just trying to help someone, you're going to get the health benefits. If you're doing it because, oh man, it's time to be at the hospital in five minutes again, oh, you're not going to get the health benefits of it. 68% um, felt he healthier physically. And I found this in multiple studies through Harvard, through Mayo Clinic, and even in the UK. Um, people's health improved and they were thinking well is it because healthier people volunteer more and that's why that's a healthier population in general or is it their health improved um, through volunteering and they did find out that as they tested them before they volunteered and after at least six months of volunteering their time or however they, their efforts or whatever they did, um, their health did improve, in fact. And so it's emotionally important as well. Uh, one third, one third of the U.S. population currently experiences anxiety and depression. And they have found multiple studies that it actually, because it decreases stress and people have a sense of purpose when they volunteer, um, that anxiety and depression is also helped just through that one act of volunteering. Um, it's also found to help with chronic pain, heart disease, um, and this, um, again, is written a little bit ago, um, 
and it's in Councils on Temperance and Bible Hygiene. It is an excellent book. The condition of the mind affects the health of the physical system. If the mind is free and happy from a consciousness of right doing and a sense of satisfaction in causing happiness to others, it creates a cheerfulness that would react upon the whole system, causing a freer circulation of the blood and a toning up of the entire body. The blessing of God is a healing power, and those who are abundant in benefiting others will realize that wondrous blessing in both heart and life. So it's helping physically, it's helping mentally, and it definitely helps spiritually. And if you think about it, I'm not actually going to read all those quotes, but the first quote talks about Christ and how Christ and the, the whole um, character of God is giving. He gave his son for us. The son gave himself for us. And everywhere you look throughout the Bible, it says, ask, and it will be given to you. And when you look at the second quote, um, I feel like we've kind of become a little bit uh, of a nation of get, 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 how much can I get? And I think, as I was reading through this, I think about the one parable, multiple parables throughout the Bible, but one particular one that Jesus spoke of, of the man who kept getting and getting and building, he tore down the barns he had and built bigger barns to hold and store all that he had instead of helping others, distributing And poor and needy people were coming to him, and he just built bigger barns for himself. And the Lord said, you fool, don't you know that tonight you're going to die? What does it matter that you have all this and your soul is lost? So truly, even from, again, all the studies that that we've looked at, um, and I will put up some of those at the very end, and there are multiple, just go ahead and research it online, there are multiple studies out there on this. Um, truly the value of a man should be seen in what he gives and not in what he is able to receive. And I know all of you have heard the famous quote by John F. Kennedy, think not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And so same principle applies um, for us as well, and definitely much more so as Bible-believing Christians. I hope you're going to take this to heart and it's going to help you um, and just help out like, like that um, video said, no, there are lots of different problems in the world and you're not going to be able to solve one just by yourself, but you can help and you can be part of the solution rather than the problem. Thank you. Cipriana, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. That was excellent, wasn't it? No wonder I've been feeling so valuable and, and happy and blessed because I have a very wonderful and fun part in the program. I get to give. I get to give these books away every night of the meeting. So I look forward to it. So now I know why. <laughs> Anyway, um, oh, there you are. (laughs) Hi, Terry. Hi there. Um, I I wanted to just read an an excerpt here from um, a a short review from Agatha Thrash, medical doctor at at, uh, medical director at Yushi Pines um, Institute for many years. She has passed passed away now, but... uh, uh, she, she wrote this about the little book. It's printed here in the back. A more practical, economical, vegetarian cookbook cannot be found because it is compact. Only the best recipes have found their way into this culinary treasure house. Simple, delightful, and tasty meals may be prepared from its pages by beginner and expert alike. So, whether we have um, been cooking vegetarian meals a while or we're just starting out this little book is will be a blessing and we like I said you know we wish we had 
boxes of these so that we can just give them out to everybody. We would do that, but we don't. So with our limited uh, amount or number of, of books, we, this is why we're having this feature, giving away these books every night. So tonight, let's see who gets the vegetarian um, cooking book. Okay, last three numbers, eight, four, five. Eight, forty-five. There you go, Kelly, come on. Is this your first night here? <laughs> you have, oh, wonderful, and you just came here to win this book, of course. That's wonderful. So good to have you here tonight. God bless you. That is great. So um, those that are uh, tuning in online and um, you'd like to, you know, win a book, uh, come in person and we'll see what we can do. All right, the great controversy. This is the great controversy between between. Um, God and the enemy, Satan. And this is something that started in heaven and it has continued through our history here as human beings on this earth. But it goes beyond where we're at today, even to the day when there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. And the former things will have, have passed. The new will have come. We will be with Jesus, and we will spend an eternity with him. This is the book that, that, that starts at the destruction of Jerusalem all the way down to the end of time and beyond. Uh, beautiful book, great controversy. And the, the person that, oh, wow, 844. Wasn't that last one 845? 844. You already had the book. Would you like me to draw again? What would you like? All right, uh, Terry, come back here. Here, and I'll let you give it to the next person. Just a moment. I need another number. She already has you the book. <laughs> let me mix it up or... Okay, 823, 823. Virginia, there he is, 823. Now huh? now <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Very good. Congratulations. I just want to make sure everyone has an envelope tonight. Everyone have an envelope? Who does not have an envelope here? And I think over there and to my far left here, on the right, good. We're going to have our ushers nice and busy here. In a moment, Celeste Esau is going to lead us in our theme song. That's a beautiful theme song, isn't it? Oh, brother, be faithful. It's, it's, a, it's a call. And... Before we sing together, I just want to say a few words about the fact that the Holy Spirit has been working here in this place, night by night as the message is given and the message is heard and received. People have responded because of the Spirit of God. It's not a preacher. It's the Word of God and the Holy Spirit using His Word to bring home to us the truth and bring about a change of mind, conversion. We're all on the journey and we're at different places. But it's wonderful to know that God's Spirit is working and people are responding. And I'd just like to praise God tonight for that. 
And because the Spirit has been very obvious to us, I want to take this envelope very seriously because in the back it says, I am interested in Bible studies, a phone call, a visit, or baptism. I want to encourage you to use this. If the Spirit tonight brings home the message, touches your life, draws you to Him to make, take another step, whether it's begin to study the Bible more seriously, uh, prepare for baptism, or to be included in the baptism that we are planning for this coming Saturday morning. And um, we would love to hear from you. So wherever you're at, according to the Spirit, listen and respond, and we will be there to help you along the way. So I just wanted to call attention to that. I have and am in the process of formulating a list of individuals that have already said, I want to be baptized. I want to be included this, um, this coming weekend in the baptism. There's others that are saying, you know, I want that, but I need a little more time. And that's okay, too. We want it to be God's timing. But if this coming weekend is the time for you, please let us know so, we, we, so that we can include you. Thank you. And now, Celeste, if you come forward. That's a good question. Um, what's that? Okay, just uh, if you're online and you want to respond to the Word of God and to the moving of the Spirit in your life, you can just let us know in the comments. Give us a phone number, and we will get in touch with you. Thank you very much. Please stand with me as we sing our opening song, Oh Brother, Be Faithful. faithful. Good evening, friends. Good evening. So good to see you all again. Um, so exciting. I know so many people have been joining us online the nights that they can't make it. They've been online, following online and watching online. Even in light of our technical difficulties, we were still able to get up uh, a hand recorded video and even some audio. So I want to praise the Lord for that. For anyone who's here tonight for the first time, either in person or online, 
Just want to say welcome to you. My name is Gordon McGee, speaker and evangelist for Go Stand and Preach. And I have partnered, we have partnered with the Sandpoint Seventh-day Adventist Church to put on these series of meetings, these series of meetings uh, entitled Keeping the End in Mind, Wake Up America. Friends, have you been blessed so far? Have you learned anything new? Amen? So have I. It's been a treat. It's really been a treat. We are at the halfway point. Uh, how many people uh, did the homework? All right, you had two nights. Well, you had, you had one night off. All right, it was John chapter 11, and then I gave you a little extra homework because I forgot to give you the homework the night before, uh, which was Daniel 2, 7, and 8. So John chapter 11 was last night's homework, and I'm going to give you tonight's homework right now so I don't forget, friends. Uh, Isaiah, the 58th chapter is your homework assignment. Isaiah chapter 58. Amen? And as you're writing down Isaiah chapter 58, those online, I expect you to be doing the homework as well, so please make sure you comment, chime in, let us know uh, if you're doing the homework. Don't forget, if you do have a question, you can also utilize the white envelope uh, for questions as well. Um, the, the calendar, the schedule. Friends, we are past the halfway point of the series. Can you believe that? Seems like we just started, friends. Uh, tonight, uh, we are covering the seal of God. Tomorrow night, mark of the beast. Tomorrow night, mark the mark of the beast. Thursday, the woman of truth. Uh, Friday, my personal testimony from bad boy to church boy. You don't want to miss that one. Uh, you notice that I skipped Wednesday because Wednesday would be our last night off. So you have a break Wednesday. And then Saturday morning, 11 a.m., there'll be the river of life. And then after that, there's going to be baptisms. Amen? Praise God. Uh, I pray you take the uh, pastor's encouragement to utilize that envelope to communicate to us if you are desirous to be baptized, if you want to make that step, follow Jesus down into that watery grave and on to eternity, friends. Uh, there is no, listen, sometimes you can make a decision uh, what job to work at, where to live, amen? What car to buy, what car to drive, what shoes to buy, what jacket to put on. We have a lot of choices to make in life, amen? There is no decision, no more choice, more important, no choice more important than this one, Amen? So prayerfully consider that, my, by my friends. Um, and then 6.30 p.m. Saturday night will be our last meeting entitled Israel and the Millennium. Amen? Amen. Let's have a quick review here. Ha, praise the Lord. Last night, well, excuse me, the night before, we met and we studied asleep in the dust. Is that right? Praise the Lord. I got the right set of notes here. Jesus equated death to a sleep. True or false? True. Amen. Amen. Man is clay plus the breath of life. And then he became a living soul. We learned that God didn't grab a living soul off a shelf and put it into some clay. But it was a math equation. Clay plus the, plus the breath of life equals a living soul. Amen. When man dies, his body returns to the dust. Amen. When man dies, the breath of life goes back to God who gave it. Amen? When man dies, he goes to the grave and nowhere else. Amen? Isn't that a comforting thought, friends? That you can go and sleep and be done with the, the work here on this earth? Amen. That's a comforting thought for me. Um, there are some saints we learned already in heaven, though. A, a few lucky folks have made it already. Enoch was translated. He's the longest living human being known to anybody. I wonder what he's been doing all these years. I want to find it out. I'm going to ask him a lot of questions. What have you been doing with yourself? Maybe he can give me a tour of the universe. Amen? He should be well-versed. Almost 7,000 years of hanging out, you know, with the angels and with Jesus. We learn that only God possesses immortality, no one else. Amen? Praise the Lord. The dead cannot communicate with the living. All right. The dead know nothing, friends. So when mediums are speaking to supposed dead relatives, we learned that they're speaking to devils, evil spirits. 
friends, fallen angels. I don't want to have anything to do with that. What about you? Hmm. Satan uses spiritism to deceive the entire world, friends, the entire world. Sorcerers, right, uh, and hell will be destroyed in the lake of fire. So we found out while there wasn't an eternally burning hell, God will purify and cleanse the earth with fire. Satan and his angels, those who have chosen uh, to be sinners, will be treated much like cancer. You have to remove cancer from the body so the body can live. Amen? And friends, I pray we choose to be on God's side. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also learned, lastly and most importantly, that Satan's counterfeit is devils, spirits, alcohol spirits, but he's trying to counterfeit the Spirit of God that God wants to give us. Amen? The Holy Spirit. God wants to have us filled with the Holy Ghost, and the devil wants us to be filled with fallen spirits. So I pray we make the right decision on that issue. Tonight, the seal of God, friends. Let's begin with the word of prayer, as as we always do. I would invite you to bow your heads. O gracious, kind, loving, merciful Heavenly Father, we ask that you would send us the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost and that he would be here leading and guiding us into all truth as you promised he would, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are soft. Father, I pray the truth would be clearly delineated tonight, that those who are under the sound of my voice in person or online would clearly understand what the seal of God is and to make a decision to be sealed by you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, friends, we start in Genesis. Many of us are familiar with Adam and Eve and their first two male child children recorded in the book of Genesis chapter 4. After sin entered this new world, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, God established a sacrificial system. Remember, he made them coats of skin, friends. An animal had to die for that to happen and explained that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. He told them that these sacrifices pointed forward to the time when Jesus would come as a man and die as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. And you can find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first prophecy ever recorded in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Adam, excuse me, Abel, was a keeper of sheep, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 4, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Adam and Eve's first two sons differed vastly in their personalities and behavior. Cain longed to farm and build while Abel loved to roam the hills and meadows with his flocks. The Bible goes on to tell us, and in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Let me explain that to you a little bit. Abel faithfully brought a young lamb as a sacrifice for his sins, which pointed to Jesus. But in a process of time, Cain thought it was unnecessary to obey God's command so precisely. Maybe he considered the sacrificial system to be too messy and reasoned that as long as he brought an offering and worshiped God, the details wouldn't matter. Hmm. So he brought an offering of his own works, some produce from the field. Now, friends, don't forget, just a chapter prior to this, God curses the ground. Hmm. And then Cain decides, I'm going to give God an offering from the ground the cursed ground. I can imagine as Cain watched with jealous anger as fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice, but left his own offering untouched. Friends, just like today, many Christians have decided the type of worship they're going to give God. Mm -hmm. And they haven't checked with Jesus. They haven't checked with the Bible. They have the same mind of Cain. This is good enough. God should accept this. This is the best I have. This is what I like. This is what I think is good enough for worship. So here, you accept this, God. And then they get jealous, angry, upset when God says, no, that's, that's not what I want. Hmm. 
And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and did what, friends? Slew him. The Lord lovingly urged Cain, if you remember, to humble himself and obey in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. But Cain stubbornly persisted in his rebellion. I would imagine Abel also tried to gently reason with his brother. But, you know, Cain flew off in a bit of, a bit of rage. Hmm. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now, we know that this blood wasn't crying out literally, right? Abel was the first Christian martyr, friends. He died over worship. Hmm. It was an issue of worship, how to worship God correctly. He lost his life over that, friends. For worshiping God the way God asked, his own brother took his life. By the time he regained his senses, Cain, that is, Abel's bloody body lay there at his feet, friends. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him, in Genesis 4, verse 15. God is so gracious, friends. You kill and murder your brother in cold blood, and then Cain is scared, well, they might kill me. Most of us would have said, well, good for you. you that's what you deserve but not our Heavenly Father. He says, I'm going to place a mark on you that anyone who comes along after this will not kill you. Hmm. The book of Revelation tells us that in the last days, friend, in the last days, there will again be a battle between Christians regarding how and when to worship. How, when, and who to worship. Soon everyone will be identified either by the seal of God or by the mark of the beast. Cain and Abel represent two classes of individuals all the way until Jesus comes, friends. This is a type. It lets us know at the end of the world, God declares the end with the beginning. It lets us know that at the end of the world, there will be an issue over worship, and there will be a class of people who are worshiping it correctly, and there will be a class who are not worshiping God correctly, who are not worshiping correctly, and they will rise up in anger and kill God's true believers. Are you ready? Hmm. Which side will you be on? First question tonight. The four winds are held until when? We're going to start in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have what, friends? Sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The four winds are held until God's servants are sealed. And once they're sealed in the foreheads, Notice they will be protected from the four winds. Much like when Cain received his mark, he was protected from being killed. If you follow me, say amen. All right, want to make sure I'm not losing anyone tonight. Our second question. What do the sealed servants get victory over? Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. I want you to notice something, friends. God is desirous to make you and I fireproof. Did you catch it or did you miss it? Those who are sealed, they're standing on the sea of glass mingled with fire and they're not being hurt. Much like that burning bush that was not consumed, much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in that fire, Jesus standing there with them, fireproof, friends. Hmm. What did they get victory over? The beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Praise the Lord. What happens to those that worship the beast, though? What about those who worship the beast? What happens to them? Let's see. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of who, friends? God. Who wants to drink of the wine of the wrath of God? 
which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. It's not diluted, friends. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. What is the wrath of God? Anyone know? Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 goes on to say, Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of who? God. So the seven last plagues are the wrath of God. The four winds are let loose. The wrath of God is poured out, and those who receive the mark of the beast, his number, his name, they receive the seven last plagues. For those who may not know what those are are going to be noisome and grievous sores, blood becoming like the blood of the sea, becoming like the blood of dead men, rivers and fountains being made blood. The sun is going to scorch men with fire. That's the fourth plague. The seat of the beast, where the beast is seated, his kingdom shall be full of darkness. The great river Euphrates will be dried up to make way for the children of the east. And the air will be touched, and there will fall from men great hail, the size and weight of a talon. Do you know how heavy a talon is, friends? 72 pounds. Now, I used to live in Colorado. Anybody live in Colorado before? Do you remember the hail that would, I mean, would take your car and make it look like a golf ball? They were the size of golf balls. I mean, the insurance company hated this. I mean, pow, 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 pow. Can you imagine a piece of hail falling from the sky that's 72 pounds? That's a meteor, friends. Oh, friends, I do not want to receive the mark of the beast, friends. How does the Bible describe God's servants that are sealed? Revelation 14, verse 10. Here is the patience of the who, friends? Saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We're going to discuss more of this when we get to the woman of truth. But here you know who are those that receive the seal of God. They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, how was the sealing typified in the Old Testament? I love this. This is one of the reasons, you know, we got into the sanctuary early on in the meetings, because it has, it plays a role even down to the end of time. Look at this, friends. Uh, that picture there, uh, that is the high priest in his garb, okay? This is what the high priest looks like, the mediator between God and man in the Old Testament. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold. Pure gold, friends. You know gold is a symbol for character, spiritually speaking, symbolically speaking. You know, you, when, you, when you burn gold and cook gold, all the impurities rise to the top, correct? And then you scrape it off and you polish gold and then you can see your reflection in it eventually, can't you? That's what God wants to do with you and I. He wants us to be polished gold, friends. Gold with no impurities in it, amen? You can say amen to that. That's a good one, friends. I like it. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to who? The Lord. Now, I wonder what a placement of this signet is going to be, or this pure gold plate is going to be. Now, what word is inside signet? Sign. Very good. Amen. Don't forget that. We're moving on. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace. Blue is a a color for the law of God. Those tables of stone that, if I remember correctly, that Moses took up to God, that God wrote on with his own finger, spoke with his own mouth, were like sapphire, were a blue color, friends. Put it on blue lace, that it may be upon the miter, upon the forefront of the miter it shall be. That's the hat, friends. Now look at this. And it shall be upon Aaron's what, friends? Forehead. We all know where our forehead is, right? You, know, you get the little babies, you go, tell me, tell me where your ears are, right? So we all know where our foreheads are, amen? Always upon his forehead, always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Exodus 28, verse 38. Aaron's garments here typify the sealing of God's people, who are the priests at the end of time. Who are they, I wonder? Hmm? Aaron was a priest. He typified Christ, but he also represented the priest at the end of the world. So here 
on the forehead. Holiness to the Lord. Friends, there's a, there's a lesson here when I think about the media that we can consume today. Come on, talk to me. I shall, set not, I shall set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the way of those who turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. All that is pure, holy, and just, right? These are the things that we should be taking in. This mind right here is supposed to be holiness to the Lord. Say amen to that. Amen. Don't miss that, friends. We can't miss that lesson. Who are the priests at the end of the world? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. That's you and me. All right? Moving on. What is a literal seal? Sometimes we can, make, we can get ahead of ourselves. Let us first just understand what is a literal seal so then we can understand the spiritual applications behind that. Amen? First the natural, then the spiritual. So what is a literal seal? You may be familiar with this. <coughs> like you see here in the picture, a seal would oftentimes be attached to a ring. A seal traditionally was engraved with the name, title, and territory of the owner. Sometimes a seal would bear the image and or superscription of the owner. That ring or seal would be impressed upon wax and set to a letter or even an object if so desired. If you remember in Matthew 27, verse 66, they set a seal to Christ's stone, the stone in front of Christ's tomb. Mm -hmm. And then they set soldiers there. So what does that mean? The purpose of a seal is to communicate ownership, authority, approval, and oftentimes utilized to keep a thing closed or to make unalterable. Mm -hmm. And for the record, Job 38, 14, 1 Kings 21, 8, and Esther 8, 8, if you want to go look that up. And there you go, an example there of an of a old-time uh, seal uh, during the time of Jesus, some type of Roman seal of some sort in the ring, okay? You can think of it like a credit card too sometimes, amen? Dad gives you the ring, you can go charge some things up. I've got the seal. Now, this even holds true today. How many of you own a business here? Anyone own a business here? Anyone own an LLC or anything like that? All right. Even, even in a modern seal today, these three elements are there. The name, title, and territory. Right? Organic Acres, that's the name. What, it, what is it? It's a limited liability company. And where is it out of? Delaware. Say amen if you're tracking with me. All right, it's simple, friends. What is the seal the righteous have in their foreheads then? All right, so God's seal should have the same three components. It should have his name, his title, and his territory. What do you say? Amen? Amen. That was a good hearty amen. Praise the Lord. You're following me. Bind up the testimony. Seal the what, friends? The law among my disciples. Isaiah 8, verse 16. So we have to turn to God's law to find the seal of the living God. So when we turn to the God's law, we should find a commandment. We should find in the heart of God's law something that's going to point out his name, his title, and his territory. Do you think we're going to find that? Oh, I think so. I'm cheating, though. I put it together, so I know it's there. You don't know it's there just yet. All right, number nine. Which of the Ten Commandments in the law contains all the elements of a seal? Mm -hmm. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. There's his name, friends. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Mm. Friends, the fourth commandment, is the only commandment that contains all the elements we need for a seal. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is God's seal, friends. Let's walk through it. His name, the Lord God Jehovah, Yahweh. That's his name, right? In the Old Testament, when, the Lord, when it's all capitalized, that's the unspoken name of God there. So it has God's name there. Then it tells you who he is, his title. He's the maker, the creator creator. Amen? And then what's his territory? Heaven and earth, friends. Now, let me, let me show you something very powerful here. 
If I take the fourth commandment, this is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If I take the fourth commandment and extract it from the commandments, do you know I can serve any God and keep the other nine? I'm taking you somewhere. I can be a good person. I can worship one God. I cannot worship any graven images. I cannot take his name in vain. I can honor my mother and my father, be a Buddhist, be a Scientologist. Hmm? I cannot commit adultery. I cannot steal. I cannot cheat. I cannot lie. I cannot bear false witness. I can keep nine of those commandments and worship and serve any other God on the planet, and you wouldn't know anything that's going on. But when you insert the fourth commandment in, that all changes. Now I'm serving Jehovah. Now I'm serving Yahweh. Now I'm serving the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. Now I know who I'm serving, friends. Say amen to that. I have some of my good Jehovah's Witness friends that come by, and they like to stress me about the name of God. And so I had a nice uh, couple come by my home once, and I said, you know, tell me why you're here. Just, just give it to me straight. Why are you here? What am I missing as a Christian? I said, it's the name of God. Then I said, yeah, yeah, you got the name of God. I said, listen, let me ask you a question. You're stressing the name of God, but you're not stressing the Sabbath. That doesn't make any sense to me. Because what God are you serving if you're not keeping the Sabbath? Who, who is Jehovah? How do I know who Jehovah is? He's the creator and maker of all, of heaven and earth. You need it all, friends. Mm-hmm. If you understand that, say amen. Amen. All right, very good. What is the sign of God's identity and power? Now, what I just explained to you about you needing the fourth commandment, I'm going to show you from Scripture that that's true. And it's not just an idea that I came up with on my own. Look at this. We're in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. 2020 vision, huh? Hallow my Sabbaths, right? When you see the word Sabbath plural like that, that encompasses all the feasts, all monthly, but also the weekly Sabbath, friends, okay? Hallow my Sabbaths, right? And they go weekly, weekly until Jesus comes, friends. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a what? A sign between me and you that you may know what? That I am. Think about what you just read, friends. You know how you're going to know who I am? Do you know how you're going to know I'm the God that created you? But when you keep my Sabbaths. That's how you know that I am the Lord, your God, not somebody else's God, not some foreign God, some undescript God. When you keep my Sabbath, you will know that I am Jehovah, mm. that I am Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath marks that you are serving the Lord, Jehovah, creator of heaven and earth without a shadow of a doubt. So if you extract the fourth commandment, I don't know who you're serving. Hmm. Let's move on. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord thy God. That does what, friends? Sanctify them. Now, this doesn't really hold any weight if you don't know what the word sanctify means. So let me tell you. Sanctify, to cleanse, purify, or make holy. That is to set apart or appoint for a holy or sacred religious use. The Sabbath is a sign that God is cleansing you, purifying you, making you holy, and setting you apart for a holy use. Say amen to that. The same way he took the seventh day of the week, set it apart from the other six common days, and made it holy and sacred and appointed it for religious use. Ooh, that was good stuff right there. Come on. God is consistent, friends. He doesn't change. He's not all over the place. There's a, a specific reason why he's using the Sabbath as the sign that he's going to pur purify you, make you holy, and set you aside. Because God don't need rest, friends. God does not need rest. He was very intentional. I'm going to take this seventh day right here. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to sanctify it, set it aside. And that's the same thing I'm going to do to my people. So this is the sign that they might know that I am the Lord thy God that sanctify thee. Amen? Oh, it's so sweet, friends. Ver verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations 
that ye may know that I am the Lord that do have sanctified you throughout your generations. For how long? Let's see. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for a few days. What does forever mean, friends? All right. All right. Forever. Amen. God clearly states that he gave this Sabbath as a sign of who he is and his power to create and sanctify, friends. It is his seal or mark of authority forever. Hmm. The Sabbath is God's sign, but how do we know for sure it is his seal? Right? Some of us, if you have a brain like me, it's like, well, Brother Gordon, I've I seen sign, 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 sign. I didn't see anything about a seal, though. Amen? All right. We're going to the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 11. And he, the he being Abraham, received the sign of what? Circumcision. A what what was it? It was a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had before the circumcision. So the words seal, sign, mark, and token are all used interchangeably throughout the Bible. You can compare Genesis chapter 17 verse 11 with Romans 4.11, and you can also compare Revelation 7.3 with Ezekiel 9.4. You can go back and watch the video later, friends. Sign is a seal, friends. Amen? The Bible's telling us that. That's not my personal opinion or thought there. Now, which day in the week is the Sabbath or seventh day? Now, why am I saying that it's the seventh day or that the seventh day is the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath means rest, friends. We know it occurs on the seventh day because of the creation week. Okay? Because of the creation week. That's how we know it's the seventh day, because of the first week of creation. And then in Exodus 16, verse 26, remember when ancient Israel was coming out of Egypt before they received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, back in chapter 16, that's what happened to chapter 20, Moses is told to have the people keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. There would be no extra manna on the seventh day of the week. So Exodus 16, verse 26, lets us know what day of the week it is. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and howled it. Exodus 20, verse 11. So we're looking for which day is the seventh day of the week or the Sabbath. Amen? Well, how many of you have a calendar on your phone or on your laptop? I do. So I'm a very simple person. So I just flew it open, took a screenshot for you. This was actually back in February, as you can see. (laughs) Now, my calendar starts on a Sunday. Amen? Then it goes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This weekly cycle, so I said, okay, well, Sunday's day one, and I just counted seven days across, amen? That's simple, isn't it? Friends, the only reason why there is a seven-day weekly cycle is because of Genesis. Or let me say this way, because of God creating the week in seven literal days, which is recorded in Genesis. There is no other scientific reason that there's seven days in a week. Challenge me. How come it's not eight days? How come it's not ten days? How come it's not three days? Why don't we go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? There's only one place on on all of planet Earth that you're going to find the reason for a seven-day weekly cycle, and it's in Genesis, friends. Say amen. 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 Come on, man. God, whoo, fighting against Jesus. I don't know why, friends. Why are we fighting against God? Come on, we got to, why are we fighting against God? So, Google. Oh, man, Google. Ooh, Google. Mmm. I don't even know who owns the company anymore. Let's, somebody get me on the phone with Google, boy. Oh, you ready for this, friends? So, many of you will probably leave here, get your phones out, and you're going to be good Bereans. You're going to fact check me. All my millennial, all my young people here use Google. All my young people, anybody young person use Google? All right, yeah, you're, getting de- you're being deceived, friend. Look at this, look at this. I typed in the seventh day of the week, and look what Google told me. 
Sunday. I said, hold on now. I had my calendar on my laptop. It said, I'm like, hold on, that's not right. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It should have been Saturday, but it says Sunday. Friends, this is a problem, friends. Come on, who thinks this is a problem? This is a huge problem, especially for my younger millennial people. Like, you gonna, I mean, if Google said it, it's fact. You close, well, you don't close your phone anymore. Look how old I'm, not a flip phone, sorry, guys. You slide your phone in your pocket, and you're gone, man. And you go say, man, that pastor, that evangelist, he was in there lying to us. All right. We're going to stay on Google. We're going to get this done. We're going to get this done right. Then I searched. I typed in first day of the week. And then he told me it was Monday. I said, what in the world is going on? Monday. I said, wait a minute. Okay. I said, all right. So then I typed in, what day of the week did Jesus rise from the dead? And then he told me, Sunday. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, Google versus the Bible, which is about to happen right now. Google just told me that Sunday is the seventh day of the week. Yes? Yes. Did Google tell me that Sunday was the seventh day of the week? Yes or no? Yes. And then he told me that Jesus rose on Sunday, right? Which would have been the seventh day of the week. Yes? What does the Bible say? Now, when Jesus was risen early, the... Amen. First day of the week. I'm in Mark 16, verse 9. Come on. And they returned, they being the women, and prepared spices, anointments. They were going to anoint God's body, Christ's body, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. I'm going to unpack this a little bit. This is Luke writing about what the women did when they wanted to anoint Christ's body. The Lord and Savior who died for our sins, he is dead in the grave, and it's time to go anoint the Lord's body. Amen? But he's dead already, and they're keeping the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, for all the lawyers in the room, you know, your last will and testament, you cannot make changes to my will after I'm dead, right? Amen? So once the testator dies, that's it. If I gave you the house, you get the house. If I gave my son the car, he gets the car. There's no change that can be made. So Jesus is dead. And I'm hearing sometimes that, oh, the commandments have been changed. That S- Saturday became Sunday. And we, oh, I'm like, wait a minute. Well, h- how come in Luke chapter 23, verse 56, they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Okay, so they're still keeping the Sabbath, yes or no? All right, amen, amen. Now upon the first, so that happened Saturday night, that, ha- that happened Sabbath night. The next day was the first day of the week. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, amen? All right. So I, I, was, I was destined to prove Google wrong. So I said, I got one for them. Who's ever heard of Easter Sunday? Amen. Where we take pagan religion and mix it with Christianity? Okay. So we'll make sure we're on the same page here. Listen, friends, uh, bunnies, eggs have nothing to do with Jesus. Amen. 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 That's paganism creeping into the church, friends. Okay. Easter Sunday is observed by Christians to celebrate and commemorate the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week when he rose, Sunday. But Jesus instructed the church to commemorate his life, death, burial, and resurrection with two ordinances. Do you know what they were or what they are? Communion and baptism. Let me be clear. Let me say this again to you. The church has decided we're going to keep Easter Sunday to commemorate his resurrection. But Jesus said, no, keep communion and baptism to recognize my death, life, burial, resurrection. Amen? I want you to be thinking about Cain as we're going through this study tonight, friends. Can we do it our way or do we have to do it God's way? Come on. 
We're going to make our own festivals, make our own holidays and say, God, accept this. When he, he clearly gave us instruction, keep this in remembrance of me. I will not drink of this cup again till I drink it new with you in heaven. Have mercy. Nowhere in Scripture are we instructed to keep Easter or Sunday as a festival, holy day, or as the Sabbath, friends. Amen. But I'm on Google's tail. I'm, I'm tracking them down. I said, all right, Sunday. is Easter. Okay, Easter Sunday. I got you now. So then I typed in, what day does Easter fall on every year? Because now what I'm saying is, Google's about to tell me that Jesus rose on the first day. Even though they just told me he rose on the seventh day. Mm-hmm. I started reading, Easter is a movable feast, so it does not happen on the same date from year to year. However, it is always observed on a Sunday between March 22nd and April 25th. Easter always occurs on the first Sunday after the Pascal full moon, friends. Sunday's the first day of the week. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Say amen to that. Amen, friends. So now that we know this, Thank you, Google, for well, this huge workout I had to go through. First day of the week's right there. Now you'll notice I've updated my chart and I circled the sixth and the seventh day. Do you know why that is, friends? Because in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, it says the evening and the morning were the first day. So, you know, we changed our calendar, we changed our time, and now we go midnight to midnight and all this other foolishness. But when you read the Bible, the, the person who we got the weekly cycle from, amen? God gave it to us. And he said, evening to the morning is the first day. So Sabbath begins Thursday night, I mean Friday night, pardon me, at sunset evening to the next evening, which will be Saturday evening, amen? That's a full day, biblically speaking, amen? Amen. Because we can't trust Google. So the Sabbath runs from Friday evening to Saturday evening, friends. Amen? All right. Is the seal of God a visible mark? What do you think? Some people are looking for a chip. Some people are looking for a credit card. Some people are nervous. Vaccines. You hear everything, right? Everyone's, oh, mark of the beast. All right, let's go to the Bible. Say of the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and, upon, and for a memorial between thine eyes. This was Moses speaking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, friends. It wasn't a literal physical sign on the hand or a literal record between the eyes. Between the eyes is where your mind is. Between your eyes is where your frontal lobe is. This is where all your reasoning and spirituality happens in the frontal lobe. Which is why God is telling you to keep the frontal lobe pure and clean. Listen, friends, this is why we're doing the health lectures at the beginning every night. Because the battle is for the mind, right? Amen? And Satan wants to turn off your frontal lobe. He wants to download. He wants to put you, he wants to, put you to sleep through poor diet through poor lifestyle choices, through television, through media, so you will receive the mark of the beast. I'm going to show you. Whatsoever thy hands findeth to do, do it with thy might. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Neither the mark of the beast nor the seal of God is outwardly visible. The forehead represents the mind, and the hand is a symbol of work, friends. On the hand and between the eyes are consistent symbols in Scripture for a person's thoughts and his actions. You can see Exodus 13, 16, Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, and Deuteronomy 11, verse 18 to further establish that truth. It is how we think and is what we do. That will determine if you have and received the mark of the beast. It will not be a physical sign. It will not be a credit card. It will not be anything else. It won't be a tattoo, friends. It's about your mind. And it's about what you're going to do. Now, 
Now, you know, we're beginning to close here. <clears throat> How did God's ancient leaders regard the great things of his law? There's nothing new under the sun. So as we go back to the pages in the Old Testament, we'll find that, you know, the, the issues have been the same. Here's what I mean. God raises up a prophet to give his people warning. Thou hast remembered the law of thy God. Oh, I'm sorry. Thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. Speaking to his own people. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Times have not changed, friends. God has placed the Sabbath, his great sign, in the middle of his law and begins that commandment with the word, remember. I would like to submit to you, it starts with remember because he knew we would forget. Amen? He says, man, these folks are going to forget this thing. Remember the Sabbath day. Yet many people today feel that keeping the seventh day Sabbath is a strange thing. Isn't that interesting? I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. I remember when I first came into this truth, and I'll give you more of this in my testimony, but man, everyone was like, man, what are you doing? Keeping the Sabbath. I'm like, man, I see it in the Bible. I mean, that's what God said, but it's strange. Hmm. We're called to be peculiar, friends. What was God's criticism of his ancient priests and pastors? All right. Maybe they had it right, friends. Let's see. Ye have caused many to stumble at the what? The law. He's speaking to his leaders, friends. The pastors of the day. Hmm? They made many to stumble at the law. You have not kept my ways, but you have, but have been partial in the law. God is still hurt when his pastors are partial to eight or nine commandments. You've heard of this, friends. We keep all of them except one. Yeah, yeah, don't steal. Yeah, yeah, don't kill. Yeah, yeah, uh, Sabbath. Oh, no, 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 no. Friends, early on in our, in our study, 1 John 3, 4, the only way you know what sin is, you need the law to tell you. Mm -hmm. Virtually. All churches admit in their official writings that there is no scripture support for Sunday sacredness. Tragically, both Protestantism and Catholicism stand guilty before the judgment bar of God for throwing out the Bible Sabbath. God himself gave the Sabbath as a sign or mark of his power to create and his power to sanctify and save. Amen? We saw that tonight for ourselves. Dare any man tamper with this sacred sign which represents the great God of heaven? in all that he stands for? Hmm. Will we not fear God, friends? What specific solemn rebuke did God give to the religious leaders regarding his holy Sabbath specifically? Look at this, friends. Thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. Who knows what the word profane means? I've got one hand. Praise the Lord. Going to learn something tonight then. The word profane means to make common, to treat common. So God was telling his people of old, ancient Israel, you have taken my Sabbath day and treated it like a common, regular day. You've treated it like the other six days in the week. They were out there buying and selling on the Sabbath. They were doing all type of common work. That's why they went into captivity, friends, because they were breaking the Sabbaths and they weren't letting the land rest. That's why they ended up in Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, because they had broken the covenant and now they were receiving the curses. And God said, while you're in captivity, then my land shall rest, then she shall keep her Sabbaths while you're locked up. Mm -hmm. Profane means to treat as or make common. He continues on, her priest, her priest, have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have not, they have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. And have hid their eyes 
from my Sabbaths have done what? Friends, is that intentional or accidental? Intentional. They see it. They recognize it. Billy Graham even knows what day to, he knew what day the Sabbath was, friends. He knew. And he did just like this young lady did in this picture. Oh, my congregation's not ready for it, friends. Maybe at a later day, later time. He went to the grave and his, his people don't know. Hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. I am profane now. Now I'm being treated as something common. Something not holy. This is what we're doing. Oh, I don't see it, friend. Of course you don't see it. You're covering your eyes. You're hiding your eyes from the Sabbath. Ezekiel 22, verse 28. And her prophets have daubed them with untampered mortar, friends, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. God pointedly rebukes religious leaders who say that the Sabbath doesn't matter and who claim the Bible teaches else, teaches something else. Oh, no, the Scriptures say you're supposed to keep, no, no, it doesn't. When you're doing that, friends, you're saying God has spoken when he hasn't spoken. There are only eight texts in the New Testament that refer to the first day of the week, and not one of them talks about keeping it holy. Not one of them. And that change would have had to have happened before Christ died, which we've already covered. Saying the Lord has spoken when he has not spoken, friends. Mm. All right, we're closing. What specific sin does God command his leaders to denounce? To denounce. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a what? Trumpet. And show my people their transgression or their sin. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, whose holy day is it? Is ours or is it God's? It's God's, amen? And call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. God charges spiritual leaders to call Sabbath breakers or Sabbath breaking a sin, friend and to insist that his people keep his Sabbath day holy. You know, the disciples had this experience when they were being told by the religious leaders of their day, hey, be quiet and stop talking about Jesus. They said we ought to obey God rather than man. Amen? Friends, that's the same advice I would give you tonight. We ought to obey God rather than man, friends. First John 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mm. When you decide to follow or to accept Jesus and fully follow him, what happens, friends? Look at this. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest, Sabbath, unto thy soul. Mm. Matthew 11, verse 29. I would like to submit something to you, friends. Hmm. You have to first say yes to the seal of God in order to say no to the mark of the beast. This is why we're covering this first before the mark of the beast. If we're not, the people who don't receive the mark of the beast keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen? So how can we be accounted as one of those people if we're rejecting the seal of God, the seal of the living God? Do Christians really think we're going to reject the seal of the living God and then turn around and not receive the mark of the beast? This is a serious, friends, this is so serious. Listen, friends, it's so serious, Google's lying about it, friends. 
are they a religious organization? I thought with all this talk of fake news and we've got a fact checked and you can't put out anything false online. Have you heard this, friends? All this, oh, it has to be accurate. We have to, we have to take that down because it's copyright issues. You, set, you spoke against COVID. We've got, that's not true. We've got to take it down. Friends, take, Sunday is not Saturday, friends. Take it down. Somebody go check that. We want the truth and all the truth, friends. Don't lie to me. Don't deceive me. Let me make my own decision. Let me be fully informed. Amen? Oh, man, this stuff get me fired up, brother, when they're lying to our faces. Friends, in closing, it is my prayer, friends, my sincere prayer, that you would make a decision, a conscious, intellectual, not fear-based, not because your mother, your daddy, your friend, but you see it from Scripture that God's commandments have not been changed. He wants us to honor the Sabbath. It is a sign, a seal, mark that He is sanctifying us, and it tells us who this God is that we serve, and that you would come under that banner of Sabbath keepers. Because, friends, I'm going to keep it plain with you. They're going through, friends. Those who keep the commandments of God, they're going through. Those are the ones that God is identifying as the remnant. Now, I realize tonight somebody online, somebody here, this may be the first time you're hearing this, but friends, it's the truth. Eight people, a world full of people, and eight people got on the ark with Noah. If you're going to make this decision based off, oh, the whole world is keeping a different day, friends, that's the wrong answer. If Noah would have made that decision, well, let me go with the rest of the world. He would have been lost too. Eight people got in the ark. I'm not looking for the majority to believe in the truth, friends. I have a friend. I have a friend that has a relative who found out about the Sabbath, right? Of his own study, of his own accord, and thought he was going to be the only Sabbath keeper in the world and went out living that way. Amen? If you see something from the Bible is true, if it's just you, stand on the Word of God, friends. Amen? Listen. If you know and God is impressing you that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, it has not been changed, and you want to stand with God's people, I would ask you to stand to your feet now, friends. Amen. Amen. God sees you, beloved. We are nearing home, friends. We're going to be home very soon. Very soon. And God wants a people that love him. That keep all the commandments of God, friends. Not by their own strength, not by their own power, not by works, but by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let me pray for you. Gracious, kind, loving Heavenly Father, you've seen your children that have stood in person or online. And I pray, Lord, you would help them not to waver in their conviction to keep the Bible, biblical Sabbath, for God. And I pray that you would give them your spirit in any persecution, Lord, any ridicule that they might go under from friends, family, co-workers. I pray that you would make their foreheads like flint. And that their hearts would be sold out to serve God and to obey God rather than man is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Tomorrow night, the mark of the beast, friends. Don't forget to get your lessons on the way out. If you have a question, put it on the envelope. And friends, if you are considering baptism, if you want more Bible studies, utilize that envelope tonight, please. May God bless and keep you and thank you for coming. Amen.